Oh, these tapes are going too long. I'm talking too much. <sighs> Today, let's talk about behaviorism. Behaviorism was wildly popular for several different reasons. Um, the people who, who thought it up made it easy to think about. You didn't have to worry about unconscious processes or um, like Freudian sort of things, sexual urges. You didn't have to worry about anything like that because all it meant was this stimuli happened in the environment and you had a specific response for that. Um, anyway, you can't really talk about behaviorism without talking about associationism first. Uh, associationism really starts with the philosophers Locke and David Hume, uh, John Locke and David Hume. Um, but really it starts with Pavlov, and I don't really want to talk about the whole dog salivation experiment um, because we're going to talk about that in class. But pretty much what Pavlov, who was a biologist studying uh, dog digestion, or digestion using dogs, um, what he discovered was that dog, there were times when the dogs would salivate when there was no food present. If there's no food present, how can this be? And what he kind of discovered was they, the dogs were making an, a food association with him, not that they were going to eat him, but that he meant food was coming, which was something that they hadn't really thought about before. This particular slide I'm not going to read for you, so please pause and read through this um, and then start again with the next slide. All I really want to say here is that behaviorism is very objective. Everything that occurs is strictly an elicited, as a result of an elicited stimuli from the environment. There are actually three kinds of behaviorism, but I'm only going to talk about these two. I believe the third one is methodological. Um, substance dualism in the first line has to do with the idea that I'm telling you that a behavior came from the environment uh, and that second part would have to do with um, mental processes. So we're not really talking about mental processes. But if I say I was analyzing that, well, what, what does that mean and where was I doing that? I mean, obviously it was in your brain, but that's where your behaviorism came from as well. So we want to avoid that dualism. This kind of explains uh, behaviorism's popularity. Again, I'm not really going to read this. I would appreciate it if you just look through this. A token economy is where you give a, a piece of something. Let's say it's a game piece or let maybe play money and when uh, an autistic per I haven't seen this used for schizophrenia, but that's what they were talking about. If an autistic person cleans their room on their own without needing help or being reminded all the time, they get a token. Now that token by itself does not get them anything. They must collect a certain number of tokens and then, and only then, can they be allowed to turn that in for something that they would want. This is not only a token economy, but it is a kind of delayed gratification. Um, John, uh, I break behaviorism down into early and late behaviorism. There's no distinction between early and late behaviorism, but John Watson kind of like was one way and B.F. Skinner was completely different. Watson got his degree from the University of Chicago, I believe. During his doctoral thesis, he was forced by the university to make some guesses about why rats were behaving a certain way. Well, that sounds kind of ridiculous. Who knows why those rats were behaving a certain way? And he thought that too. How can I be expected to make guesses about why rats are behaving a certain way? So, just a, a, a fairly short period of time before um, Watson got his degree, Pavlov had published uh, about his dog experiment. And what 
uh, Watson's major contribution was, let's make psychology an objective science. We don't want to be laughed at. Uh, behaviorism actually was a wholesale rejection of structuralism and functionalism. Um, so let's be so objective that no one can ever make fun of us. When I say this behavior exists because of this stimuli, there will be no questions about it. It won't be, well, this person was angry and didn't, you know, didn't not behave, uh, did not behave the same way. So he focused on classical conditioning. Classical conditioning uses reflexes and this sort of my own vernacular is requires a teacher, uh, someone to structure the, the environment or the learning task for you that it doesn't happen on, on your own. Um, we'll be talking in class about the little Albert experiment where he took a child who did not have fears and conditioned a fear into him. Um, Watson believed in tabula rasa, which means that you are a blank slate. You don't come with anything in your head when you're born. Um, the next one is uh, B.F. Skinner, and B.F. Skinner was even more sort of logical, objective science uh, than Skinner was. But one of the things that that Skinner did that, that Watson did not do is he included the environment. For example, um, if I'm out in the wild and I need to find something to eat, I may eat something, I don't have any idea what it is, but if it makes me sick, I won't do it again. That's not something that Watson had actually sort of mapped out in his theory. So in uh, Skinner's operant conditioning, the individual, the subject, becomes a, a participant, let's say. So you're no longer dealing with just uh, reflexes like pain, ouch, don't do that, uh, or fear, the startle response like little Albert. Um, and he had what he called uh, learning histories. That is, all the things that I ate that made me sick, I'm not going to eat those anymore. But the things that I ate that I really liked, that tasted good, I'm going to go and try those again. All right, in this one what I'd like to talk about are just some vocabulary words. Reinforcement, positive and negative. Um, I, don't, I don't want to draw this out. Reinforcement, positive. Do good, get good. I do something good, and I get something good in return. But if you do bad, you get nothing. That's important. With negative, I do bad, and I get bad. But if I do something good, I get nothing. Now, if you have any questions about these, I'll explain them in class. Um, schedules of reinforcement. There are fixed and there are variable. Now, there are actually a lot more than that, but all I want to talk about is these two. A fixed um, schedule of reinforcement stays the same. If I'm going to give that organism a, a reward every fifth time they display a behavior, then that's what will stay. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, reinforcement. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, reinforcement. Or it could be every one. Like, you do something, I'll give you something. You, you do something for me again, i give you something again. But a variable means that the organism never knows when it's going to be reinforced. You do something, I'll give you something. And then you do something again, I don't do it. You do something again, I don't do it. You do something again, I don't do it. And then, boom, I'll reinforce maybe the fourth or fifth time after that. It's always changing, as odd as it seems, that the variable schedule of reinforcement is the most successful because the organism tries its hardest every single time. What do you think happens in the fixed uh, schedule? Why would the organism not try as hard? Um, primary and secondary reinforcer. A primary reinforcer is something that I like and it's something that I don't have to be taught to like. If I'm starving, I need food and I'm going to do what it takes to get food. Um, a secondary reinforcer is something that I have to be, I have to get used to. It would be like some unusual food or, um, I don't know, think of something that you have to develop a taste for, something that you wouldn't like initially maybe. Uh, cigarettes would be one of the things. I've heard bad things happen to you the very first time that you have a cigarette, but why do people smoke? Why do they continue to smoke? It can't be the nicotine the very first or second time, right? Um, successive approximation is what they use, for example, when they're going to have a rat go through a maze. They don't put the cheese at the very end, 
and then the rat into the beginning of the maze, you'd have a lot of dead rats. So they put the cheese close to the beginning where the rat can actually get to it, or the mouse or organism, whatever it is. And then you position it just a little bit further so that the rat will, has, has done the first couple turns so many times, it'll do that one immediately. And there's like, hey, what happens? I got cheated, right? But then it'll find the cheese again, or whatever, the food, the food item. Until eventually, you've conditioned that rat so often in so many steps that finally it can do it all the way through. I suppose it would be like maybe teaching the alphabet. Uh, maybe the first time the, the young person can only remember a couple of letters, then you keep on doing those first couple letters that they'll remember and then you add a few more until finally they can get through the whole thing. And superstition, this is something that um, um, Skinner uh, talked about. An organism will be rewarded just at intervals. So there's nothing that it's doing that causes the reward to be released. But what he found is that, and this I think was pigeons uh, that he was using, was that whatever the pigeon was doing, at the time that the food item was released, that the pigeon continued to do those behaviors, even though those behaviors had nothing to do with the release of the reward. Uh, I would say sometimes sports individuals are like this. They might have lucky socks or uh, a lucky mitt. Uh, a person might uh, be in a risky behavior like racing, flying, and they might wear something you know, on their, uh, on their clothing that they feel is lucky because um, something had happened before while they were wearing that particular uh, item. What are all these letters? UCS means unconditioned stimuli. UCR is unconditioned response. The UCS and UCR are things that the organism or the person does naturally. This is not a learned behavior. This is something that you would do without having to be taught. If I gave you a pain stimuli, you would not have to think, hmm, how do I feel about this? No, you would just react. You would have some sort of reaction. You would maybe say something, make a noise, or you may actually move away from me, right? Or whoever it was that was providing the stimuli. Uh, let's use Pavlov. The stimuli is food. The response from the dog is salivation. The second line, UCS, NS. The NS is a neutral stimuli. This would be something that the dog would not normally react to. For example, could be a pencil. You show a dog a pencil, it's not going to have necessarily a response. Um, so you have the stimuli, remember, in the Pavlovian experiment, it was food. So you have the food, and I believe it was a whistle, actually, but let's just say it was a bell. You give the food and the bell within a quarter of a second. You would have to, one per because of the, the short time period, one person would give the food while the bell was ringing. And of course, the response is not to the bell, but to the food. You're just making that association. Food, bell, food, bell, food, bell. Now what happens, you notice, you're just providing the NS the neutral stimuli, but what happens then? You actually get the unconditioned response. At that point, your NS has now become a CS. It is not a neutral stimuli, it is a conditioned stimuli. And the uncondi unconditioned response now becomes a conditioned response. One other thing that's important to note here is that the UCR and the CR, each one of these responses is exactly the same response, but your stimuli changed. Now I'd like to talk about some critiques of uh, behaviorism. Behaviorism is really not in the mind at all. It doesn't talk about neurobiology. Um, that is, if something in the environment afraid you. <laughs> if something in the environment scares you, then that would be a fear response triggered by that thing. 
But what about when you scare yourself? Not because you bumped into somebody that you couldn't see, like you walk around a corner, but you're thinking about, oh my gosh, I could lose my job, oh my gosh, my girlfriend might leave me, my relationship might end, you know, something along those lines. Um, you scare yourself. It doesn't really um, answer that at all. It doesn't explain emotion very well. Why do we have emotions? Why is that important? Is that a survival technique? How can that be? If we're so, so upset that we are non-functional anymore, how can that be a, a functional reaction? It doesn't explain love at all. The idea that you do something for someone else without wanting or expecting uh, a reward for it. Um, it doesn't explain, it's in fact, it, it totally denies free will. I like, I have favorites, I make choices. It really doesn't talk about that or accept that idea at all. Um, anything having to do with internal mental processes, um, you don't analyze, you don't conceptualize, you don't problem solve, you just have reactions. If something bad was to happen now, a behaviorist would say you would react in a random behaviors until some behavior you did happened to work. Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy. Behaviorism is not a therapy in and of itself anymore, although I'm, I'm sure you could probably find someone out there who really does behavioral therapy only. Now it's cognitive behavioral. Um, you have a you have a situation where your behavior is maladaptive. Um, it's not getting you the response that you want. You think about what are the, what are the things that are triggering me, and then you do something more constructive. I know that sounds kind of simplistic, and that's not a very good explanation, but that's pretty much the way it works. Um, your brain reacts to that stimuli by releasing uh, a.